Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So, in the last lecture, you remember we were talking about instrumental variables and um, so far we have discussed uh, the assumptions of instrumental variables and we also discussed how to estimate um, uh, the, the uh, two stage least squares actually and then we, um, we went on from there to understand that the context in which IVs become very uh, useful and, um, uh, and uh, apart from the secondary data that where you can use the instrumental variable, you can find uh, uh, a, an instrument that satisfies both of the assumptions of um, uh, validity and um, that is instrument exogeneity and the relevance conditions. Um, you can implement an instrumental variable strategy in uh, secondary um, data, but we also discuss the case where an instrumental variable becomes uh, uh, an instrumental variable strategy becomes very um, useful and very handy uh, when you have a context of an experiment, a randomized experiment, but uh, with non-compliance. And we saw that how instrumental variable can be used to retrieve the structural parameter in such cases. So, what we are going to do today is carry the discussion forward with a very important specification issue of instrumental variable strategy, uh, namely the inclusion of exogenous covariates from the structural model. Okay, so, what do we mean by the structural model? The structural model is basically the regression equation of interest or the relationship of interest. So, let us say we were discussing in the last lecture this um, the, the experiment where we are trying to understand the effect of financial literacy training on um, insurance take up. So, so, the idea that you are trying to understand whether financial literacy actually helps or uh, increases insurance take up is your structural question or the structural equation that you are estimating. But the instrumental variable that you have over there that, um, it, that becomes instrumental in affecting the financial literacy, um, uh, financial literacy levels of individuals was uh, this uh, whether you attended the financial literacy classes or whether you were offered a free financial literacy training. So, that was the instrumental variable. So, in this context suppose um, uh, now we go back to our very uh, the original uh, example of uh, returns to education. So, in this particular case we have returns to college education and what we are trying to understand here is that uh, in the structural regression equation. So, consider this regression over here in the structural regression equation if you have to include exogenous regressors in addition to the regressor of interest then what is the correct specification in the sense that we have two stages of estimation. So, should you include these covariates, these exogenous covariates also in the first stage of your regression estimation. So, what we would do is we would consider a very specific example to understand why exogenous covariates must be included in the first stage of IV regressions. So, the idea is that uh, if you have, if you are estimating a, a structural equation of let us say uh, the, the uh, once again the um, uh, equation of interest is the effect of x on y and you have the regression y equal to alpha plus beta x and your coefficient of interest is beta and suppose in addition to x you have a series of covariates uh, like x1, x2 and so on that you need to control for in your structural equation, then what this is saying is that x1, x2 should not only come in the structural or the second stage equation estimation, but it should also appear in the first stage estimation for the IV estimation to be correctly specified and we want to understand why that is the case. So, we would take this particular paper, a seminal paper by David Card in 1995. Uh, who asks the same question that is what is the college premium or uh, whether um, enrollment in college increases your returns to, uh, returns to schooling or increases your 
um, earnings in other words and the title of the paper is using geographic variation in college proximity to estimate the returns to schooling and it does exactly that it basically y over here as you see is the earnings some sort of a let us say wage of individuals x is college it is college education and uh, and then you have a series of I will come to the discussion of what g is and then you have a series of covariates and u. Now, what David Carr does in this paper is to instrument so naturally this x which is college education affecting y would have lot of uh, problems uh, or lot of endogeneity problems when you are trying to estimate b2 uh, by an OLS method specifically we can think of omitted variables like uh, the classic case of omitted variable which is ability biases you can have family background variables which affect both x and y you can in addition have measurement error in x and so on and so forth so one um, you know, one way out or one uh, uh, one solution to this problem is of course, to have an instrumental variable which you use to instrument for x. Now, what David Card uses is something um, uh, where he talks about the proximity of a college. So, whether a person has a college near his home or not. So, the reason the, the reason that he gives the argument that he gives for a dummy variable whether there is a college nearby to be a relevant IV is that he says that students who grow up in an area without a college face a higher cost of college education since the option of living at home is precluded. The higher cost is li likely to reduce investments in higher education. So, what we are saying over here is that suppose a person lives in a neighborhood or in a village where there is no college and you are comparing that person to another person who lives in a village where there is a college nearby. So, naturally for the person who has a college nearby is easier to enroll into college than for a person who does not have a college nearby and will have to travel long distances and in some cases uh, maybe the college is so far that a daily travel is out of question and the person might have to actually relocate and move to a place near the college and that of course increases the costs because now you cannot stay at your parents place and uh, and do the college education you have to go and stay somewhere near pay for the rent your living costs etc all of these things add up and hence investment in college becomes uh, more expensive. So, what David Card asks uh, says is that people who are living near the college because the cost of college education comes down hence the probability of going to college for those people would increase and hence he uses this as an instrumental variable. So, what we what we have to do first is to understand whether this instrument which is proximity to a college whether this is a relevant instrument and whether this is an exogenous instrument. So, what Card, uh, David Card does is uh, to estimate the first stage regression where x is the college outcome, the college enrollment and z is proximity to college. Okay. However, note that um, there is one issue over here that proximity to college could be correlated with um, geographic location. Specifically, we might expect that rural areas are less likely to have colleges than urban areas. So, which means if you are comparing two uh, individuals one who stays in the city one who stays in a village then the person who lives in the city is more likely to have a college nearby than the person who stays in the villages and that raises a problem because their geographic location acts as a as an omitted variable. So, what you want to do is in such a regression in the structural equation you want to control for this geographic location may be rural urban may be other forms of geographic location indicators, but you want to control for that. So, you do not have the case of omitted variables. So, proximity to college so for z to be an a valid instrument proximity to college must be correlated with college enrollment. Right. So, that is the if you recall that is the relevance condition that we had discussed before the assumption of i v, but it must be uncorrelated with this v over here the unobserved factors that affect both college enrollment and earnings. So, it must be uncorrelated with v which is the exogeneity assumption. 
But the, now the question is does proximity to college satisfy these two assumptions? So, is, is college proximity unrelated to unobserved factors that correlate with earnings or the why in your case? So, college proximity is possibly related to geography in particular urban versus rural location as we just discussed that people who are living in rural areas are more likely to have a college in proximate areas than people who live in urban areas. In addition, there is another problem over here. So, the classic problem remember when you are trying to estimate um, uh, returns to schooling or returns to any kind of education is this missing ability. There could be many omitted variables and the classic omitted variable that, literature, uh, that the literature considers is this ability bias. So, in some sense what we can think of is uh, th there is a omitted variable problem that comes through motivation, inherent motivation of individuals or IQ. So, suppose IQ varies by rural urban region. So, suppose just for um, uh, the example sake, suppose IQ in urban regions is higher than IQ in rural regions. You can also think of the other way around a negative correlation that is, but at the same time IQ obviously also affects college enrollment. Okay. So, for example, in cities people might be more likely to have a college and at the same time average IQ might be higher in cities. Then this proximity to college variable, the IV that you are using or the, uh, the IV that David Card uses in his paper affects both IQ which is the omitted variable remember and wages Why? through this geographic location variable G because Z is related to G and G is related to IQ which means Z is related to this omitted IQ through G. And Z is also related to Y not just through college enrollment, but also through this variable G. So, in other words what we are saying over here is that individuals who live in cities are more likely to go to colleges not simply because colleges are proximate to them, but because of many other reasons one of them being ability or motivation. So, maybe people who live in the cities are more motivated or more able than people who live in villages and people who live in cities are also the ones who are more likely to have a college nearby. So, because of this correlation which means that your Z is effectively correlated with this unobserved factor or unobserved error V. And that brings up or makes the instrument invalid. So, without controlling for those geographic indicators in the first stage, proximity to college can still be correlated with IQ because remember uh, Z is correlated with G in this case. When G is excluded from the regression equation, this means that this correlation is now there in IQ which is not observed and which is in the error term V and hence uh, Z which is the IV is now not independent of V, but it actually correlated with V and U in the structural equation. The Z might be correlated with X only because of the correlation of Z with G and hence V through the omitted IQ variable. So, what you might end up with is if you do not include G in the first stage what you might have is so re recall just um, this is important over here. So, what we have is this first stage where you are regressing Z on X. Okay. So, this is your college X is your call uh, uh, your enrollment in college Z is proximity to college and this is the first stage that you are trying to regress and if you do not have G then the covariance between x and z could be a result of this omitted g which is correlated with v due to the omitted iq as well. Okay. So, which means that now the only way out is for you to control for g in this regression. So, once you control for g then this omitted variable bias is taken care of because you have explicitly controlled for g and then the estimate of B is unbiased. So, it is not the Z which is partially correlated with X, but in the absence of G what you might have is that the covariance XZ is not equal to 0 
it captures the spurious correlation between z and g and the omitted iq iq variable which is there in the error term okay and this essentially what means is that this spills over to the second stage and what you end up getting is that the covariance from this for so the the predicted value of x from the first stage x hat that you use for the estimation of the second stage is now correlated with the second stage error term u or the structural error term u so this means that this condition over here clearly shows that your iv is not valid it doesn't satisfy the exogeneity condition Right. So, this makes the instrument invalid and hence uh, this uh, basically shows you why it is important for us to um, control for g in the first stage. And in addition to this, I mean uh, in, in, in uh, uh, another way to understand this intuitively is the idea of conditional randomization. If you recall that we had discussed conditional randomization when we were doing experiments. So, there was one case of full randomization when you do not, um, uh, so if you have a sample of 100 people, you fully randomize means that every individual has equal probability of being in the control and the treatment group. Conditional randomization means that if you condition on certain groups, let us say if you condition on gender, then everyone within female group would have the same probability of being in the treatment and control group everyone within the male group would again have the same probability of being in the treatment and control group, but these two probabilities within the female and the male might be different. That depends on the total number of female in the whole sample, total number of male in the whole sample and um, this just means that you are conditioning on gender to randomize and hence it is a conditional randomization. So, this whole idea of controlling for covariates in the first stage of IV is uh, actually comes from the idea of conditional randomization. So, let us see what this says. The assumption is that z is random in the first stage only conditional on covariates, right. If that is the case, then just like in conditional randomization, the first stage estimate would be inconsistent if the covariates conditional on which z is random are not controlled for. And hence, you what this means in turn is that this inconsistency from the first stage spills over to the second stage estimation to give you an inconsistent IV estimate. And this makes you makes it imperative that you should control for all the covariates that are required in the second stage also in the first stage. So, uh, th there is a uh, there is a very nice summarization of this whole uh, point in the mostly harmless econometrics book by um, Angrist and Pishke. What they say is intuitively conditional on covariates, the two SLS estimation retains only the variation in x that is generated by quasi experimental variation that is generated by the instrument z. So, uh, we will understand this even uh, better when we talk about the standard errors in IV estimation just a few slides on. So, there is one last thing in this discussion of covariates in the first stage which is um, the fact that um, which is a very specific case of IV estimator which is called the walled estimator. So, to understand this intuitively what we need to consider is the special case of IV, the walled estimator. So, what is the walled estimator? Let us look at it first. So, the walled estimator is a special case of IV where the IV, the instrumental variable is a binary variable. So, it is a binary instrument. So, for instance, uh, this is typically the case in the case of experiments where you either belong to a treatment group or you belong to a control group and hence very likely or in many cases the IV is a binary variable. So, what this is saying is that the IV estimate over here, recall we had uh, done a, uh, a derivation of the IV estimate where the IV, if you recall the IV beta i v we had derived as d y d z over d x d z and this is very similar this idea is very similar to this derivation that we had done earlier. So, what we have is you first calculate d y d z. Now, remember this is an experiment where z is 
uh, randomly uh, allocated between the control and the treatment group, which means that this DYDZ estimator is going to be a causal estimator to the extent that uh, Z is randomly um, allocated. So, what you what you uh, have as d y as the estimate of d y d z is the mean difference in y between the treatment and the control group. So, suppose the treatment group is where z equal to 1 and the control group is where z equal to 0, then the mean difference between the treatment and the control group is the mean y in the treatment minus the mean y in the control group. To make it more specific, let us take the uh, example once again, let us go back to the example of the financial training program, where we are saying that um, Z, the instrument is basically whether I offer you to freely attend a financial training class. And suppose uh, that you are considering the effect on insurance take up, then Y is insurance take up. So, Z is equal to 1 or 0 because either you get the offer of attending the class for free or you do not get the offer of attending the class for free. So, then your expectation of y given z equal to 1 is essentially uh, the average insurance take up for people who were offered a free, insur uh, free financial literacy class and expectation of y given z equal to 0 is the average insurance take up for people who were not offered the free training. So, once you have this, you can also get delta x delta z. What is delta x delta z? So, remember the structural equation or the structural relationship of interest is not the relationship between y which is insurance take up and financial literacy training or actual financial literacy levels, but it was um, uh, uh, so, so this is the structural equation of the structural uh, um, uh, um, relationship of, of interest, but what you end up with as z is the reduced form where z is whether I was offering you or the experimenter was offering this person a financial literacy class for free. So, this relationship d, delta x delta z acts as a bridge between the two the reduced form and the structural relationship and it gives you how does your financial literacy um, training or let us say level or financial literacy understanding varies with whether you were offered a financial literacy class for free and you were not offered a financial literacy class for free. So, essentially what it is giving you is the expectation of x given z equal to 1 which is the average financial literacy levels for people who were offered free financial literacy training. And the average, so this is expectation of x given z equal to 0 is the average uh, financial literacy levels for people who were not offered financial literacy training. Now, once you get this difference or this average estimate, the expectation beta vault, the vault estimator is simply the ratio of these two. Okay. So, this estimator is called the vault estimator or the grouping estimator and it is essentially the reduced form difference in means divided by the corresponding first stage difference in means. Okay. Just to remind you once more, we had done a very similar example before. If you recall, the intuitive derivation, the uh, uh, this is this was one way of deriving the IV estimator, and this is identical to this vault estimator because the example that we had considered was a, a case where the instrument Z was a 0, 1 or a binary variable. So, suppose a one unit change in the instrument Z, which is a movement from say 0 to uh, 1, is associated with 0 0.2 more hours of attention in class. So, what we so, just once again to remind you, what we are doing over here is trying to understand the effect of class attention on let us say wages that you get when you go out into the labor market. Okay, so, some sort of a proxy for productivity. So, what we are saying is that suppose one unit change in the instrument Z is associated with 0 0.2 more hours of attention in class and with a 500 increase in entry salary, rupees 500 increase. So, this means that this rupees 500 increase is basically the delta y delta z that you saw in the previous slide and this 0 0.2 more hours of class attention is the delta x 
delta z that you saw in the previous slide. So, then effectively it follows that 0 0.2 more hours of attention in class is associated with 500 rupees increase in salary of a worker. Then the causal estimate of beta which is beta IV or you can call it beta volt now is therefore 2500 rupees for one extra hour of attention raises the salary by 2500 rupees. So, this is what we discussed is the Wald formula in the sense that the Wald estimator is nothing but a special case of IV where the instrumental variable is a binary um, is a binary variable. Okay. So, in this context now see what this means is that what we were discussing earlier intuitively once again intuitively conditional on covariates the 2 SLS retains only the variation in x that is generated by the quasi experimental variation which is that is generated by the instrument x, z. So, this means that the effect of z on y conditional on covariates and the effect of z on x conditional on covariates. So, if z is not fully randomized, but it is only partially randomized or let us say conditionally randomized, then to get the causal estimates of delta y delta z and delta x delta z, you need to control for these uh, covariates, these conditional randomization covariates in both the cases of dy dz and dx dz. So, to give you a very um, once again uh, in the in the context of the example that we just did. So, suppose the instrument z uh, that you are giving to for class attention to in improve class attention. Let us say you say that end of the class if a, if a person uh, is more attentive then you would give the person a chocolate. So, a chocolate is the instrumental variable in this case right. So, what you are saying is that you are trying to estimate the effect of whether a chocolate is offered or not on class attention which is dx dz and the effect of whether a chocolate is offered or not on the final the entry salary of a person when they go out into the job job market for the first time after college education. So, which is dy dz. Now, this is full randomization, but suppose you take the same class and you offer the chocolates not randomly to the full class, but you offer separate to the group of women in the class, the female students and to the uh, separately to the boys in the class. So, suppose the um, class ratio of boys to girls is 7 is to 3. So, for 7 students uh, who are boys, there are 3 girls in the class. So, then if you now randomly allocate the chocolates within the group of girls and within the group of boys, then of course, the probability of a girl getting the chocolate is much higher or very different from the probability of a boy getting the chocolate in the same class. Okay. So, what uh, if you have such a uh, such a such as experimental setting, then what you need to do is you need to control for uh, the gender of the student when you are trying to estimate dx dz or where you are trying to estimate dy dz right and that is essentially what we are saying over here is that in a walled estimator case so this is the case of a walled estimator where your iv is uh, where your iv is um, uh, the uh, uh, whether you were offered a chocolate or not and in that case if you do not condition on uh, the covariate gender, then both this as well as this is going to be biased. But suppose you were only uh, conditioning for gender in the structural equation and not in the first stage equation that what that means is that now this is the first stage equation which is the denominator is going to be biased because you have not control for gender whereas it was a conditional randomization. However, the second stage this the, the reduced form in a, uh, the reduced form is actually going to be unbiased because you have conditioned for gender. However, because the IV estimator is the ratio of the two and the denominator is biased then overall you will get a biased IV estimate. Right. So, this is just another way of understanding through the Wald estimator why it is absolutely crucial to control for the covariates that you introduce in the structural equation 
or that you include in the second stage estimation also in the first stage estimation. So, we would now move on to um, the, the dis, uh, another discussion in the context of IVs which is very important. Uh, so, um, which is basically so far we were talking about the magnitude of the coefficient, the IV coefficient, the estimation, the unbiasedness property and now we are going to talk about the efficiency of the IV estimate which is basically uh, about the standard error of estimation. So, the two SLS standard errors. So, recall that we discussed um, the manual to SLS estimation in the sense that first you have the first stage, you estimate the first stage, you take the predicted values of your variable x. So, x on z, okay. you take the prediction x hat. So, this is the first stage, you take the a prediction of x hat from the first stage, you use that now in your second stage. to get the IV estimation, which means that this is a two step estimation and this two step lists, least squares as it is called um, creates a problem for the estimation of the standard error. Why? Because the OLS standard errors from the second stage regression are not the right standard errors. They do not take into account the estimation in the first stage. In other words, what it is saying is that the OLS residual variance is the variance of UI plus beta times x i minus x i hat while the proper i v standard errors um, are only the u i s in the regression. So, if you have uh, the following structural equation u i then u i is your the, the right sta um, uh, standard deviation that or the right residual that you are interested in and variance u is the right uh, is the right variance that you are interested in. But what you end up with is when you use x i hat instead of x i is this whole term in the residual. So, just to understand this, let us go back to the example that we had seen before the case of chocolate on as an IV on performance. So, basically uh, the example that we just discussed also. So, the effect of effort uh, in class on performance in class or on salary or anything. So, uh, suppose in this case we are interested in the effect of effort on performance and zi which is the instrumental variable is whether you are offered chocolates to be attentive in class or not. Then the first stage regresses effort on chocolates and getting the predicted value of effort which isolates the changes in effort that arise from chocolates and use that which is effort hat in the second stage estimation. But as soon as you put effort in the structural equation instead of effort you are using effort hat which means that you have to deduct you have to do this manipulation over here to keep it identical to the structural equation over here. right? So, the second stage is nothing but where you include the effort hat in the structural equation, but because you have included effort hat you also have to take out effort hat to make to keep it the same as the structural equation. The reason why we are doing this is to say that u is basically of your interest which is the structural uh, residual um, the error term. But what you end up with by using effort hat is this term over here. You do not have only u now, but you also have this additional term that you are deducting from u and beta effort which was already there. Okay. So, given that we are interested only in u and not the expansive or the extensive um, error term what we have is we are interested in this variance or the, this standard um, uh, this variance of beta i v the coefficient where the omega hat is the variance the estimated variance of u the structural error term and not the estimated variance of this extensive error term. Okay. So, to estimate variance u we must use x and not x hat. So, when you are doing a two stage least square estimation manually, recall that in the second stage you are using x hat. So, any statistical package that you ask to estimate the second stage 
by an OLS estimation, it is going to calculate or estimate for you not the error term from the structural regression, but the revised error term which is given by u i plus beta x i minus x hat. But what you need to do actually is instead of using x hat, you now need to go back from the beta i v which you have uh, the, the i v estimation of beta, you now need to use that and the original x not x hat to calculate the u hats. So, this was one point. The second um, consideration, so this is one correction that needs to be done when we are doing a two stage least square uh, manually, but uh, for all practical purposes most of the statistical softwares, uh, in fact all of the statistical, statistical softwares that you have if you do an IV regression, it automatically gives you the corrected standard errors, which is it is it addresses for the fact that this is a two step estimation and you are estimating x hat in the um, in the first stage and using the estimated value in the second stage rather than the actual values of x. The second consideration is that the two stage standard error uh, in the case of two stage least square estimation, the homoscedasticity assumption is now revised as expectation of u square given z instead of x before. In the case of OLS, it was given x, but now because x is endogenous and z is exogenous and you are using z to estimate, hence the conditioning is on the exogenous variable which is z. Also, in the OLS case, given asymptotic variance, given the assumption of asymptotic variance, we can estimate the standard error from a scalar regression as the standard error beta 1 hat. So, recall that in the case of OLS, this is the term which gives you the standard error for OLS estimate of beta. But in the case of IV, once again you have to address for the fact that you have an estimate of x and not the actual values of x and the estimate of x, estimate of x is coming from uh, the first stage which uses z and hence the correction over here which is the r square from the first stage, r square from a regression of z on x which you are correcting, uh, correcting for. And uh, so, this is the this r square is the only difference between the OLS standard error and the IV standard error, but what this means is very important. Now, for most cases you know that r square is uh, a correlation, so it has to be less than 1. So, because r square is less than 1, so you have a less than 1 value in the denominator and that is the only difference between the OLS and the IV standard errors. So, which means that the IV standard errors are going to be higher than the OLS standard errors because you have a value which is lower than 1 in the denominator. Okay. So, which means that stronger the correlation between z and x, higher is going to be r square z x. So, closer to 1 which means that the OLS standard errors and the IV standard errors are going to be closer higher the R square. So, this is a very important point as we will see in, in uh, simulations and you can also find out from papers that you read that IV standard errors are typically higher than OLS standard errors and this is the reason. Okay. So, now a very important case in um, hand, the case of weak instruments. So, what does this mean this uh, R square uh, from the standard errors? So, what if our assumption of the covariance z u is equal to 0 is false. Recall that this is the condition of exogeneity of the IV. Okay. So, where u is essentially the structural error term and z is the IV and this is the condition for exogeneity of the IV and uh, the IV estimator will be incons inconsistent if this is the case. However, Remember that what we are interested in is uh, just lowering the bias. So, in many cases it so happens that you might not be able to fully get rid of the bias in, um, in, in your estimation of, um, of beta 
but when you move from OLS to IV, you know that your IV takes care of most of the biases and you are getting a less biased estimate. The beta IV estimate is less biased. Suppose it is less biased than the beta OLS estimate. Okay. However, what we have now is uh, that the asymptotic bias in IV can be represented by this term over here. To see how this comes across, to see how we get this condition, uh, note that beta I v is uh, nothing but z prime x inverse z prime y. So, you could write this at z prime x inverse z prime and then you expand y as x beta plus u the structural equation. So, then what you are left with is beta plus z prime x inverse z prime u. Okay. So, if you now take expectations what you have on the right hand side is beta plus x, z prime x inverse z prime u which is nothing but beta remains as beta the expectation of beta and then you have this. So, what this is is, uh, is the covariance between x and sorry the covariance between z and u and this is the covariance between z and x and that is exactly what we had on the slides over there. So, getting back. So, this is what we just derived and what you see over here is very interesting. So, suppose you do have some bias. So, the instrument is not perfectly exogenous, but close to exogenous. So, what this means is that this term the numerator over here is close to 0, but not exactly equal to 0. So, you have a very small bias in your IV estimate, but suppose the denominator over here which is nothing but the relationship between x and z is actually the relevance condition that we had seen before. So, what we are saying is that the rel, uh, the exogeneity condition almost holds, but very close to 0, but not exactly equal to 0 and the relevance condition over here. Suppose that the relevance uh, what we have is a very weak IV in other words the relationship between x and z is very low the correlation between x and z is very low. If that is the case it artificially will blow up this full term over here because this, covari this correlation is very low it will increase the full term over here and the extent of your bias so overall bias in the IV estimate expectation beta i v hat will increase. right? So, even if you actually have a very small bias due to the exogeneity of the i v because the i v is weak. So, suppose in the case of chocolates for instance. So, suppose chocolate whether I give you chocolate or not is random because I have randomly constructed it, but suppose it is just a little bit away from randomness because after all the randomization is done by a finite sample on a computer. So, it usually it might actually fail. So, it is a little bit away from randomization. So, in that case you might end up with having a covariance of z u which is not exactly equal to 0, but close to 0. But suppose that chocolates does not incentivize you to pay attention in class. So, which means that the correlation between giving you chocolates and attention in class is actually quite weak. And then you have a covariance z x which is close to 0 which is near to 0 and that inflates this term over here the bias term over here. So, the bias in IV is higher when the first stage is very weak. 
and that is the case of weak instruments. A very important case because you need to understand whether the IV is both exogenous as well as establish that the IV is not a weak IV for your IV estimate to be credible. So, let us take a simulation example to understand all these points. So, suppose as an example we have an IV estimation uh, where the slope of the coefficient x this 0 0.5 x comes out of some data generating process. And this is the relationship that we have constructed mechanically. So, which means that x and y are correlated by this value 0 0.5. Okay. And we also allow x to depend on z a random variable and another random variable v. So, x is a function of z and v and now we have another we generate another random variable r add that to the same v and make that equal to u. So, recall that this u is the structural error over here the same u right. So, no, now what we have is that x depends on v u depends on v. So, which means that in the structural equation your x and u are correlated both of them depend on v. So, you can think of v as uh, the omitted variable in other words which is included in u and hence it is correlated with x. So, what you need is an iv and what is a classic iv in this particular example is of course, z because z is correlated by construction with x, but it is not correlated with v or with u. Right. So, it is a perfect case of instrumental variable. So, what you do is, uh, so what this means is that an OLS estimate of y on x would yield inconsistent estimates as x is correlated with u by construction and IV estimation yield should yield est, uh, co uh, consistent estimates. The variable z is a valid instrument by construction it is uncorrelated with u, but it is correlated with x exactly what we discussed. Then the another point is that because z is exogenous a monotonous transformation of z like z square or z cube must also be exogenous with respect to x and with respect to u and hence they are also valid instruments to the extent that they are relevant. So, now let us see the result of the simulation exercise. So, what we have is in the first column we just have the OLS estimation of the structural equation y on x. So, just to for your reference what we have is this regression over here and uh, this alpha is by construction equal to 0. So, what what you have uh, is you see that the coefficient the uh, the constant terms are supposed to be equal to 0 in all the, by construction. Okay. Now, when you, when we are considering the OLS um, uh, estimation what you have is you have an estimate of the coefficient on x which is beta 0 0.9 which is very different much higher than the 0 0.5 and recall that the bias comes and you are supposed to your you you would expect a bias because that is how we had constructed x was correlated with u due to the uh, due to the omission of this term v which was correlated again with x as well as with u. So, in the next column what we have is the IV estimation. So, the IV estimation is a full two step estimation not done manually and it corrects for uh, the, the um, uh, standard error uh, uh, corrects for the fact that the standard error is calculated in two steps and um, so, the second column gives you the IV estimate which is um, where it corrects for the fact that it is a two step estimation and hence the standard errors needs to be um, at uh, it needs to be correctly calculated keeping in mind that this is a two stage estimation and you should be using the error terms from the structural equation. So, what you have now is an unbiased estimate of beta which is 
uh, same as 0 0.05. The second place of decimal the difference is coming from the simulation in a finite sample. Uh, and uh, what you have is a standard error of 0 0.01. Now, you compare this value with what you have in column 3. So, now you compare column 3 with column 2 and column 3 is nothing but an IV estimation done manually in two steps without correcting for the fact that you have done a two step estimation and this correction is not accounted for uh, while calculating the standard errors. And what you see is that the standard errors are much higher than what you have in the second column. So, because you are not addressing the two step estimation while calculating the standard error which you saw before and this is what uh, the, what the simulation also gives you. In the final fourth column what you use as IV is just a monotonic transformation of z. You have used z cube, we have used z cube over here and once again what you see is that the estimate is very close to 0 0.05 and um, hence giving you an unbiased estimate and also because it is an IV estimation you have the correct standard errors. So, all this while we have been discussing various important properties of IV estimation of the 2 SLS estimation and um, uh, but remember that we were always focusing on a single endogenous regressor and the case of a single IV because we first wanted to understand the assumptions that are needed for a valid IV a relevant IV and also how to estimate, um, uh, uh, estimate using an IV uh, technique. Now, what we are going to do is try to generalize this uh, setup a little bit more and consider the case of multiple instrumental variables. So, what if you have more than one instrumental variable that affects your um, endogenous regressor x and uh, hence you can use more information. So, let us see how to go about estimating such a model. So, suppose we want to extend to the case of multiple instrumental variables. So, to make it more general what we have over here is that so far we have considered only 1 x. So, suppose now we have x 1 to x k plus r where x 1 to x k are essentially the endogenous regressors. So, you have k endogenous regressors and x k plus 1 to x x k plus r is basically the exogenous variables that are or the included exogenous regressors in your structural model. So, you have k endogenous regressors and you have r um, exogenous regressors. So, what you have over here are k plus r, r number of unknown regression coefficients that you need to estimate. But recall one thing that because you have r exogenous regressors you do not need any instrumental variables to consistently estimate the coefficients on these r exogenous regressors. They can be uh, uh, they can be instruments for themselves in other words. What you do need is you need an instrumental variable for each of the endogenous regressors that you have from z 1 to z l let us say are your l instrumental variables that you would use to instrument for the k endogenous regressors. So, we do we have recall that we have not yet discussed the relationship between l and k. We are just explaining the very general setup where you have k endogenous regressors and you have r exogenous regressors and you have l instrumental variables to instrument for k endogenous regressors. So, we would discuss three specific cases, we can have three specific cases. One is where l is equal to k and so far what we were doing is exactly this case where you have only one endogenous regressor and one instrumental variable and hence that was the case where L is equal to k and this is called the case of exact identification or exactly identified model because you just have enough information to identify the parameter of interest beta 1. To make it more general what we are saying is that suppose you have k endogenous regressors 
and you have k instrumental variables, then you are able to identify all the k coefficients from those endogenous regressors. And of course, the R coefficients from the exogenous regressors because exogenous regressors are instruments for themselves. The model is said to be under identified if you have more endogenous regressors than you have instrumental variables. That is if your L is less than K because remember then you do not, do not have as many first stage equations as you have endogenous regressors and hence you will not be able to identify you do not have as many equations as the number of variables and hence of course your model is under identified and you are not able to identify the beta 1 to beta k's. And the th third case is that of over identification. You have more instrumental variables L is higher than k you have more instrumental variables than number of endogenous regressors k. If so, and of course, because you have more endogenous, uh, more instrumental variables than the number of endogenous regressors, this model is identified, which is you can estimate all the beta 1 to beta k's coefficients. And if so, you can test whether the instruments are valid or not. So, in this very particular case of over identification, what we would do going forward is we would discuss the case of over identifying restrictions and the possibility that it gives you to identify uh, to test for the exogenity assumption. Okay. Now, the revised assumption in the case of multiple IVs is that you have a set of instruments which must be relevant and exogenous. The relevance condition re recall that earlier the relevance condition said that your IV must be correlated with x, z must be correlated with x when you had 1 x and 1 z. But in this case you have, suppose you have only 1 x, but you have many uh, uh, IVs, suppose you have 2 or 3 IVs. Then what the relevance condition says is that at least one instrument must enter the first stage regression. So, which means that at least one of your IVs must be relevant. It need not be the case that all of them are relevant, but at least one must be relevant. The instrument exogenity is actually more strict now. It says that if you are using all the instruments, then it better be the case that all the instruments are uncorrelated with the error term, which means that each and every one of the instruments must meet the exogenity condition. So, these are the revised assumptions for the case of multiple IVs. To take a very specific example, suppose we have one endogenous and one exogenous regressor. So, you have y as a function of x1 and x2 where x1 is endogenous and x2 is exogenous. So, you need an instrument z1 for x1. The case of single instrument is very straightforward what we had done before that the covariance between z1 and u must be equal to 0, the exogenity condition and the relevance conditions is just says that you have the first stage running x1 on z1 and the exogenous regressors x2 and that uh, pi 1 must be significant um, and positive or negative, which means that z1 and x1 must be significantly correlated with each other. In the case of multiple instruments, suppose you have two instruments z1 and z3, then the revised assumptions means that you have one first stage equation where x1 is a function of both z1 and z3 as well as of course, you include the exogenous term x2, but it also means that you should have both exogenity conditions met. That is z1 is not independent of u as well as z3 is independent of u, right. So, we have any one could be relevant of z1 and z3 because we have one single equation. So, any one could be relevant, but both of them must be exogenous. So, understand that there are two cases over here because we have two instrumental variables z1 and z3. Uh, this means that what would you take as a as the instrumental variable? Would you take z 1 
would you take Z3 or should you take both Z1 and Z3 and, a com and combine them together to be a combined instrumental variable. Now, the idea is that if you take only Z1 or only Z3 and suppose both of them are valid instruments that, that is they meet the exogeneity condition, then what this means is that yes they will give you consistent estimates, but when you are using only Z1 or only Z3, then they, they might be correlated individually with X, but because both of them have some partial correlation, a combination of Z1 and Z3 is likely to have a higher correlation with X. Right? And because you want the first stage R square to be as high as possible because remember uh, our estimation of the standard errors in the IV case showed you that the standard errors are more efficient when you have higher R square which means that if you use both Z1 and Z3 which brings in more information in terms of the correlation with X then this will give you a higher R square and effectively you will have a more efficient IV estimator. So, the best instrument is a linear combination of all the exogenous variables. So, which means that we should have both Z1 and Z3 and of course, the exogenous variable X2 as well and the, we use this to predict X1 and this is what we discussed that more relevant instruments can produce a smaller variance in the two SLS estimators and a higher R square from the first stage. We then use this X1 hat in the structural model and then estimate the second stage as usual like we have done in the previous cases in the case of single instrument. In models with multiple instruments the 2 SLS provides just such a linear combination by combining multiple instruments into a single instrument and then you do the same procedures as you had done before. Now one caveat over here is the following. So, consider a single equation that is y is equal to beta 1 x 1 plus beta 2 x 2 where x 2 is exogenous and x 1 is endogenous. Assume that the instrument vector z includes the exogenous regressors in x 2 as well as at least one other instrument. Now, one possible measure of r square from the first stage is the full r square of this um, regression of x 1 on z and x 2. However, it could be the case that the, the R square that you get from this regression is driven by the relationship between X2 and X1 and not the relationship between Z and X. So, it could be the case that Z is a weak IV, Z is not correlated with X1. However, X2 is correlated with X1 and that is giving you a very high R square. And if that is the case, it completely fails the case of um, a relevant IV. Right? It, it is not a relevant IV anymore and uh, what you uh, essentially end up with is an R square which is spuriously driven by the relationship between X2 and X1. So, to avoid this possibility what Bound, Jaeger and Baker did was to compute the case of partial R square which basically purges the effect of X2 and gives you the R square which is based on the relationship between X1 and Z. To address this problem what Bound, Jaeger and Baker did in 1995 was to propose the use of a partial R square that purges the effect of X2. So, what the partial R square does is basically take this um, effect the correlation between X1 and Z which is the correlation of interest and take out the effect of X2. So, once you have taken out the effect of X2 you will see the case in, in case X1 and Z are not well correlated that is Z is a weak instrument that will show up in a low partial R square uh, which is the low bound Jaeger Baker R square although your full R square from the model could be very high. Right? So, you will now this partial R square will give you exactly what you would need for the IV to be relevant which is the correlation between X1 and Z purged of the correlation between X1 and X2 and this is what is important for the estimation of IV to find out whether the IV is a relevant IV or not. Thank you very much for attending today's session.